Good evening and welcome to the Greater Rutland County Supervisory Union Board Meeting. It is Tuesday, December 5th. If you'd all please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, the first order of business is the approval of the agenda. A motion would be motion by Mike. Is there any additions, corrections? <coughs> Can we do review, review board goals? And we get an executive committee update. Review what? Board rules? Board, board goals. goals. She had asked last meeting. Because we're doing really well with them. We should bring them up and talk about it. For a and executive committee meeting, you know, just an, a five minute update. Okay. All right. And then I just want to lay to rest the phone thing. Okay. Don't give me five minutes and I'll lay it to rest because I've, I finally went back and reread and I, yeah, it's me, not the board. Okay. Okay. And um, I'd like to uh, just remove from resignations the brothers. Um, just defer that until the January meeting. All right. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. General public comment. We don't have any public with us. Uh, approval of the minutes, the no November 7th meeting minutes a motion is in order to approve those as presented so moved. i'll make that motion motion by george <laughs> any discussion all those in favor aye. aye aye any opposed motion passes unanimously approval of warrants you receive your warrants <coughs> via your grc issue email all questions and concerns should be directed to lewis a motion would be in order for the approval of warrants Motion by Mike. Discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Superintendent's report, Chris. Uh, thank you. Uh, just a few items to uh, address. Uh, this is the time of year when we begin working on our uh, obviously budget, town meetings, pre preparation for that. I do want to thank all the uh, local boards for getting back to myself, Christine, with updates on Board members who are up for re-election this year so that has been updated has been uh, cleared so if there are any uh, questions or concerns obviously just please reach out let me know uh, if you do not intend to run that's a personal choice we hate to see anyone go but please just let myself and christy know just so we can make a note of that uh, on our own files uh, we also are uh, in your drafts uh, or in your drafts a draft of the warning has been placed in will be placed in your local district uh, folders uh, one item to remember is that the language uh, in the you know, will change this year around budgeting. Um, so we'll have that new and updated language in there. Obviously, we won't have the numbers yet because we have, don't have approved budgets at our local districts levels. Uh, but just you know, you know, make note of that as well. If there's any other formatting changes or layouts that a board wants to take a look at, that's why it's there for draft or for review. We make those changes. Uh, but that will be put, uh, uploaded uh, hopefully by the end, uh, end of this week into all of our uh, board folders for you. Uh, I do want to uh, once again recognize on November 14th, I had the pleasure of uh, driving up to UVM uh, to attend the Outstanding Teacher Ceremony. It is a very nice event uh, each year that they put on the past couple of years with COVID. It's changed a little bit, but this, uh, this year it was back to its kind of its full glory. Uh, it's a nice event with a little cocktail reception. They, they do a very nice job of recognizing individuals uh, you know, we had two individuals in our SU. We have uh, Dawn Sarley, who works at Pulteney High School as a middle school English teacher, uh, was recognized, as well as Patty Ryan from Proctor High School, who's a, uh, a math teacher. So I just wanted to, once again, congratulate Dawn and Patty on just a, an accomplishment. And it was a very nice uh, evening for, for both of them. So, uh, in your, also in your packets was a, uh, a brief from the Joint Fiscal Office. Uh, it was a very long, lengthy, dense document in FAQ around Act 27. I know Lewis and I uh, were at Lake Maury today uh, for a VSA VASBO uh, joint training. And, uh, you know, we just, you know, a lot of conversations around 
you know, the shift in people waiting from, you know, and, uh, you know, the impact back to 127. Uh, so I would just advise just to read through that FAQ. Lewis and I are strategizing on uh, how uh, at our local districts we talk about the impact of Act 127, what they may look like. I know Lewis uh, sent a chat to me earlier today, uh, said that he's just starting to receive numbers around our long-term, uh, you know, uh, ADM, long-term waiting for the ADM, uh, and mm -hmm. starting to kind of figure out what that means for each of our districts. So we'll have, um, have that information for you next week at our local levels. But, uh, uh, but that is something which we are going to keep an eye on, particularly as we start looking at, uh, you'll, you'll, we heard of the Esser Cliff, which I think we did a very nice job of navigating, uh, talking with uh, Chris Leopold and other superintendents. Uh, they're having a real hard time with budgeting because they are, a lot of these Esser positions and uh, spending that they did with Esser funds are hitting local budgets, and we, uh, we're very proactive in you know, knowing that our positions and this sunsetting, we were building out a lot of capacity, so we're not in the same situation. But Act 127, uh, the, the next big concern is a fiscal cliff in 2029, 2030, just with the impacts. Uh, and so we could talk more about that and as well as we, we do budgeting, not necessarily this year, but for future years as well. So but we'll, we'll discuss that. All right. Uh, and then uh, the, so the rest of this really is just informational purposes for you. So is there any, any other questions? I'll, I'm more happy to answer that. Any questions <coughs> for Chris? All right, moving on. Lisa's not with us this evening, so we'll move on to <clears throat> contract recommendations. Uh, we have three in your packet for support staff. Noah Ricker for Proctor High School, Para, 1703 an hour. Kathy Creed, Rutland Town, Para, 1619 an hour. And Mary Satrick Clark, Proctor Elementary, Para, 2418 an hour. A motion would be in order to approve the contract recommendations as presented. Okay. Motion by Tina. Discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Motion passes. Aye. Oh, okay. Motion passes unanimously. Uh, resignations? We have Bridget Shatra from Pulteney Elementary Para, resigned effective 11-9. Brayton Deo, central office bookkeeper, resigned effective 12-15. And Samantha Bacon Racine, Rutland Town Para, resigned effective the end of FY24. A motion will be in order to accept three resignations. Motion by my discussion. Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any, Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Uh, you have in your packet, just for information, the open positions um, handout. <clears throat> Lewis, finance. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so, the, you know, uh, so tonight I'm gonna discuss the, just an answer update. Uh, so I did include it in the packet. Um, I just wanted to give you an update because we did do some, uh, I think it was two months ago we provided an update and we told you that there was some money that we were looking to, to move around and really sort of move into our final plan as we near the end of uh, the grant. Um, as, as you may all know, the grant in September 30th, 2024. So we have just about, uh, just about nine months remaining on the grant so we really need to start uh, making sure that all of the investments that we have in place are investments that we're going to be utilizing and, and then moving those around if, if we're not so the update that you have in front of you is an update that i just submitted to the state for uh, which does sort of move things around to get us to that place um, so that we're utilizing as much of the grant as possible uh, so looking at the, the first page, this is just a, a summary of all the different initiatives that we've been using the grant for. Uh, we started using the grant last year, um, and, and we plan to use it through uh, the first quarter of next year. Um, so uh, any questions on that first page before I move on to the additional pages? Uh, I, <coughs> I'm not going to go into this, each one of these in detail. This is None of this is really new information. These are all the same initiatives. 
It's just really what we've done is just move things around through these different initiatives uh, wherever we needed to shift funding. Okay, so here we've done, um, so the second page, um, so a few months ago the board uh, did uh, discuss moving some of the extra money into school enrichment funds, which the school have the opportunity to use those funds at, at their um, uh, at their discretion. Uh, they just have to submit the paperwork, and it, it get, as long as it falls within to the ESSER guidelines, then I submit that um, for processing. Uh, so originally, we the board approved the hundred thousand dollars in ESSER funds to be, which was twelve thousand five hundred dollars per school. Uh, due to the remaining funds we have available, we're moving another 100000 into school enrichment funds. So this gives the schools the ability to use these funds, again, again at, their, at their discretion uh, for school-specific items um, to, for school enrichment, student enrichment. Um, I've also provided you, based by school, what each school has spent. Uh, as well as what they've encumbered so far to date. So encumbered means that they have a plan to spend those funds and they've, done, they've submitted the paperwork to me and a PO has been created. The funds just have not been spent yet. Mike? Shouldn't that 100000 be voted on by the board though? Uh, the, <laughs> Chris, I'll leave that one to you. I mean, the board the board has approved positions, and the board uh, did approve the hundred thousand. How the hundred thousand was going to be spent, uh, but really, the majority of the grant um, has really been decided about by the superintendent on how that those funds are going to be spent. Um, for the for the schools, the the twenty five thousand that each school has for enrichment they have to spend that by FY 25 September 2024 20, they have to spend it by September 30th 2024 so next next this September coming <clears throat> any other questions for Lewis about ESSER funds All right. Uh, and then there is one last page, which just is a, a forecast of where we are based on the in investments that we have in the grant, what we spent in FY23, what we spent in FY24, so, and then the total spent. So we've spent so far 1.3 million of those 3.6 6 million in the grant. Uh, and we're forecasted to spend, at this point, we're forecasted to spend all but $30,000 of it. Uh, but that $3.6 million grant I mean, thirty thousand dollars is a small margin of error. So I mean, we're gonna we're gonna work towards spending every last penny. Um, and as we get closer to the end here, if we're still uh, have additional funds that are unspent, we'll figure out a way to spend them that'll best uh, suit all of our districts. Um, one change. Not a nickel back, Lou. Write a check for a penny. One additional change that uh, we've made in here is so there are uh, four ESSER funded positions that are local that are in the local budgets um, we funded those last year they were supposed to move to local funding this year but due to the remaining grant funds we continue to fund them through the ESSER grant uh, which is resulting in local savings again those positions are in the local budgets uh, so by funding them through ESSER those funds are not being spent at the local level and those will just flow down to surplus um, because we still have remaining funds uh, I, I moved funding those positions out through September 30th. So we get an additional three months of funding those positions, and then we'll shift those positions to local funding October 1st. And again, those, those will result in local savings for each of your districts uh, for, an, for an additional three months. Great. Anything else for us? That's it. Any other questions for Lewis? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Uh, old business. Well, we'll do the phone here. Okay. So, um, 
we did say that it was in the okay, let me go back the woman that came to us in August um, asked which was my fault because I interpreted it that it was a how are phones being are, is there problems in the schools with the phone use and when I went back and reread it that's not what she really was saying she was saying that there is enough research-based information out there that it affects learning by even having the phone in the school during the <coughs> time that kids are learning in school and um, and I did read look up some of the stuff and she does have very good um, case uh, for it um, um, and it does meet you know when you look at the strategic plan it certainly goes along with kids learning mm -hmm. and it uh, you know I would love for us at some point to have a discussion about this because what I interpreted was that I, you know, and when I, you know, even when I was subbing, you walk around and <laughs> they've got the phone out, and you're saying, "Johnny, put the fo put the phone out." You don't. This is time of, the and she's saying that this this stops the sc the learning in the school. Mm -hmm. It stops the whole way of kids. Sh the teacher has to start over again, and even so, she was taking it into a a much bigger arena than I was interpreting it so and um, so it, it came out it, it did come out in the um, I think it was October it wasn't in the minutes but it was verbally Chris had verbally said that they had talked to, to the teachers and talked to the administrators and they all felt that um, that at this point in time that the policies were in place and that they were working and everything was good you know at some point I, I would love to have a discussion about what she actually put in place because it is very interesting in terms of what say Jen is doing in terms of trying to and to get our numbers up and everything it's it's affecting the way that kids are learning okay so in that respect it was my fault not anybody else's because I misinterpreted what she had really asked for so that was about the phone thing so I, that's my apology and I'm sorry. I can add to the phone thing from from personal experience coaching football I actually had a player I turned around and looked and the player had put their phone and where their pads go so when they're sitting sitting on the sidelines on the bench poof, they could pull the phone out so so phones phones can be an issue so I think um, it's actually in the September 5th, 5th GRCSU minutes and we had a pretty lengthy discussion I mean I don't know if anybody else wants to chime in about that um, Prior to that meeting, I requested and each building principal provided what they were doing this year. I don't think it's, uh, we discussed what was happening across Rutland County and neighboring issues were pretty much right in lockstep with that. We spoke about, you know, a <clears throat> couple things. One, we have to pick our battles, right, in schools while we're still trying to teach and educate and um, I think at one point someone, you know, likened this to telling kids to keep their masks up during COVID, you know, and um, Jen's on. So as a building principal, she wants to speak to it. Um, we had asked them if there were significant issues to come to Chris, that Chris was going to come back and, you know, if we needed to do something else. But um, collectively and a lot of you were there so feel free to speak up we had decided that you know banning phones from the school was just not something that was not a path that we were looking to go down is how i recall that if if we're wrong on that if i'm wrong on that then eric uh, yeah i remember that conversation and you know I, I would say that my recollection of the conversation was is that 
you know, you, you had, we got to see what each school is doing as far as cell phone goes, but um, I think we had, uh, we had asked uh, the superintendent to reach out to all the building administrators for, I guess, an update for October. I think that's where the conversation went. So uh, the way I recall it was we hadn't actually made a definitive decision on how we were going to handle it. Um, but my, my opinion is I think we should really have a conversation or I mean, we're actually having the conversation now actually, but I, I really, I support something around cell phone usage in schools. And it may not look the same for high school or elementary, but um, you know, there's, there's a lot of supporting information out there on uh, cell phones in school and how they can affect students, uh, you know, for the long term. So um, obviously, it, you know, it could potentially lead to maybe an SU policy would be my thought, but. Yeah. Well, isn't that what we've done though? Every building has. Well, I think it's, can I just add something? Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, I think what it is, it's like it's two different things. One is the kids using the phones in the school and they get caught using them. And the other one is that the phone is actually distracting learning. Her thing, you know, and, and it was well documented was that it, even the kids um, putting their phones away during the classroom time that there's no phones in the classroom so the kids have no phones it it doesn't interrupt the learning so by kids bringing in the phones into the classroom and the teachers teaching and the kids got the phone down here which i've seen you know quite a few times you know down here you stop the classroom you and I'm not saying it's, I'm not saying it's right, you know, I'm not saying, oh, this is the way we should do it. I'm just saying that according to what she provided for us, there was some real good conversation to have about the, about in the future to have a conversation of whether the phone should be in the classroom at all because of the amount of learning that the kid the kid is looking at, I want to get to the phone, I want to get to the phone. Somebody just beeped me and I turned it down and I want to, I want to respond. And the teacher's teaching and the child has got the phone in the classroom. That was what her, and, and she took it to the nth degree, to the phone can't be in the school at all. Whether, I just thought it'd be interesting to have a conversation about phones in the classroom oh what we've done is put a policy in place so they don't have the phones at the desk with them it's, is that is that, I wasn't here for this conversation so I'm playing catch-up but but is that consistent through all the schools it's in, in the every handbook union? so that was something okay. that was provided at that meeting that every building principal because as high school and elementary school is mm -hmm. very different that building principals developed what it was that they thought was appropriate. Even across all high schools, they're doing it a little differently. In West Rutland, they bought whatever the, I can't remember what it is, but they're, they're put, they put them in an actual pack, let's say. Um, at Proctor, what are you doing, Jen? Um, they're they're either in their backpacks or out of sight while they're in class time. They can have their cell phones um, during passing or at lunchtime. And I think Poultney is similar some with that. It's in every handbook. Um, and that was, so there is something in place. Um, so I don't know if that's a misnomer that people aren't realizing that. Um, George? And that's new, oh, sorry. That was new this year because we did feel like it was a problem. So right, right. we agreed that it was a problem and so we put that in place to address that issue. Um, just so that everyone knows didn't, if they didn't see it last year while they were subbing or something, it wasn't in place last year. Jen, have you seen a difference since you've instituted that, policy, that procedure? Absolutely. It's absolutely been a change for us. Um, and of course, there are still people, like with any rule, that will um, <laughs> find a loophole or try to disobey the rule. Um, 
and we have found that with the most part we do when they do that we do confiscate the phone and then after the second time the parent has to come and pick it up and we have been very supported by the parents in doing that george um my point was going to be that any proposed changes be run by parents um, i was going to ask what the reaction was um, from that change it sounds like it's pretty positive but i think you're going to find that a lot of parents want their children to have the phone with them at school um, so just um, not allowing it at all is going to be problematic and George, I can add on to that that like that there are parents that will text their kids while in school too. So <laughs> I agree with you that that is some of the concern we had. But you know, I equate it to like Red Bull. We don't sell Red Bull in school. We're not allowed to. The kids walk in with Red Bull all the time. We don't advocate that that's what's important, but your parents are giving it to you. So we we try to not take the place of the parent, but know what's best in the learning of the classroom. And, and thank I th you. that yeah, thank you, George. And that was a huge piece of the conversation, also I think. And even when um, the individual was giving her presentation, was that we as a school are not providing phones. So it's a little bit like saying we think everybody should walk to school and no one should drive. You know, like that we're we're not providing that phone to right. them. Right, but this has to to me. This has to do with learning. You know, I, I'm not disagreeing w with you. Well, and okay. that's why we teach di digital citizenship. Right. And so we've just heard that we've put something in place that it's working. So I, for me, I think we have to listen to building admin, but. Have, have, uh, have the teachers in each of the school, has there ever been like some sort of, of discussion, meeting, uh, committee? Yes, um, so I, I just want to. I, I understand the the need. I think what's I think we're throwing a lot of anecdotal evidence out here. And like, you know, one person does not mean you know. Like so, I am welcome a discussion about responsible use of technology in our schools. I think that's an important discussion for us to have because not just you know the same parent also is saying get rid of all laptops, get the kids off laptops, and. Right. Um, so I, I'm not saying that, you know, right or wrong, that's just the reality of the where we live in. I think one of the things that we have talked about in our admin team is the accessible use of, you know, and responsible use of technology, like what is appropriate, what's not appropriate, what is supplementing that, right, a student's education, what's supplanting a student's education. Part of a, as we look at the world we live in, it is a tech-rich world we live in. We also have to make sure that our students are, have the skills necessary to navigate that world as a lead post-secondary. It doesn't mean that what it looks like for a junior or senior high school looks the same for a first or second grader or, or a third grader. And, and I am, there are some, you know, first, second graders who have cell phones, which I, you know, it said that's a personal decision, you know, that, 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 that leave it up to that. But when we look at the procedures, and like I said, there are two, you know, the disruption in classroom. And right now, when I went back to the app and they said that they've seen a decline with the procedures that were put into place but we also, I think that the next discussion really could be is as we look at what's appropriate use of technology in our schools and where is that balance and what does it look like, at, you know, for age appropriateness and things along those lines. What you also have to understand is, and this is where a lot of superintendents, because there, there's some discussion about legislation out there that they want to ban cell phones, is, and I have worked in schools in, in two different states prior to working in Vermont where they had these, you know, restrictions and it was a battle every single day. You want to talk about school culture, you want to talk climate, you're putting staff on the front lines each day that the first interaction is a negative one. Give me your phone, turn your phone on. No, I don't want to turn my phone on. I have to leave early today. Give me your phone. And it, it shifts the culture a little bit. And students, you know, want, you know, we've had a lot of students, and I think Jen could talk about this, how they're wel they welcome these procedures. Like, please take this distraction away from me, you know, but, Sometimes when you, you know, you go to that, you know, the, the, the far right, which is that draconian stance where you have the pouches. We used to have a mobile truck outside of one of our schools and the kids have to go through. And it was amazing. The kids would, you know, they bring two or three phones to school. They would, they turn in, you know, like the, the dummy phone and they would have their real phone with them. That's just the reality <laughs> of the world we, 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 we live in. And so, so it, it, I think we have to look at is what is the purpose of this? So a policy of saying, 
hey, we're going to ban cell phones in schools, if that's what the board would like to do, but understand that's not going to necessarily ban cell phones in schools. It is a part of, uh, of the lives we live in. Each one of us has a cell phone. I've heard in, in multiple board meetings, cell phones going off, people checking their messages. You know, we as board members sometimes are guilty of that in, in, uh, as well. Uh, it, it, it is like Pavlov's dog. I mean, I have an Apple Watch. It drives me nuts because it buzzes, and there are times I have to take it off because it really is this conditioned response. So I understand the distraction, but I think there's a bigger discussion that we should have outside of tonight where we really look to involve stakeholders, students, and staff, administrators to get a better understanding of where we're at. Because like I said, tonight we're just looking at anecdotal where, well, based on my experience, based on my experience, it's a much bigger discussion. And I think really understanding the complexity of what we're doing and why we're doing this. Because if it is to advance learning, I hate to say it, but there's a lot of learning that can be done on these things. You know, I mean, there's a lot of useful learning that can be done on this if done appropriately, but there's also a lot of trouble you can get right, to do this right, as well. Right. So, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a rabbit hole for a lot of our kids. Right. And my thing uh, was let's, just let's just get let Colin. Okay. Colin. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, yeah. And uh, my recollection of the meeting is what we table it, put it to bed. You know, we have a policy in place. Um, there's a lot of different. Um, Things on our plate right now. That's how that's how I left it. That's in my brain what happened. Also, if we're going to do this, I say we set it for a future meeting with with a set agenda and a set time frame. This is a rabbit hole we could go down for hours. Sure. Here's this point: anecdotal things. Uh, we're not prepared for it. But it involves getting all of the admin, or teachers, students involved. If we really want to tackle this, but I don't think you know, we could go on for hours right now talking about our thoughts and our personal feelings on it. But. Um, I think it's better off for to, to put it in the future for a stated time and have a rational discussion of what, around data versus just us throwing stuff at the wall. I okay, go ahead. I, I I know I as we it. talk about cell phones. Yes. Oh. <laughs> I, I apologize. Can you help? Um, I, I just wanted to mention. I thought we did have this conversation. We went through all admins. Yeah. Um, they, you know, we surveyed them. We talked about their procedures that they had at their school. Um, I know our Rutland Town has a procedure in place where some of the eighth graders leave it in their homeroom all day long. Um, and we found, we felt like it wasn't a problem. And, and additionally, that it was very cumbersome to come up with something that we could actually police or be consistent with. Right, my f whole thing tonight was to say that my interpretation was wrong based on what she had presented that we had asked for something was totally different than what she had presented that's all i have no what um i do not want to bring it up and say we should get rid of phones because i don't think that that is a um, practical thing i like chris's idea of saying that maybe it needs to be a larger conversation I think that's a great idea, but my thing was not to say, and the other thing was just to say that it was verbal, it wasn't in the minutes, and it, you know, that we did all this wonderful stuff, but it wasn't in there. So that's all I'm saying is I'm in perfect, I think the policies are there and the procedures and people did all that, what they did, it's going good, Jen has just said that, I'm in perfect, uh, I just wanted to say that my thing when I went back, I was wrong in terms of because what she was asking for was more towards learning, not towards owning the phone. That's all. And I have no problem with the policies and procedures, and I think the admin are doing a great job. So, and, and, and you know, just to be clear, like we don't have a policy in place that each each building has their you know guidelines or their own procedures, procedures no. for it, but we don't have a policy and um yeah so i mean you know i understand all that you know we have, we have an acceptable use policy yeah which highlights what students do with whether it be a laptop or cell phone so yeah and, and you know just kind of going back and like i said earlier you know we, we discussed it but i don't think it was you know like fully i don't think we had full consensus on how we were i think it was left and we were going to discuss it later on but it never it never happened you know i don't know i miss i missed a lot of that october meeting so i don't know if it was discussed then but um you know anyway uh you know the cell phones yeah there's you know 
there's a lot of positive, but I think there's also a lot of negative. And, and when, you know, we hear this, the feedback from the principals and, and, you know, what could be done with the cell phone, I think about, um, you know, kind of like that upper level, you know, how does, how does the board feel cell phones should be used, if any at all, in schools? And if it really does pose, you know, uh, any issues or distractions, I think that should be, you know, something to think about as well. So you, you think the board should be making that decision whether cell phones are in schools or not? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I, and I, I'm not opposed to that. I just want to make sure the board has research and has done uh, as evidence, not just anecdotal. Right. With whatever, just, you know, that, that's my only concern is it's not just a knee jerk personal, I, you know, I think because we are looking at educating students and we look at ed quality standards and all the things that are, uh, so, uh, right, and I think it's, like there, I said, I have, I have an eighth grader at home and, you know, drives me nuts with the cell phone, and but, but it's also my job as a parent to restrict that and to make sure I, I'm aware of what's going on right. as well, so, and if she does not take the phone to school and that's our, that's our, it's our job as a parent. And I, and I agree too with, you know, obviously community feedback is extremely important as well. Well, it, it, I, I just, I think it's more, and I don't want to minimize, because I think we're minimizing this. I've been through this battle many, many times. And I think, if, if, you know, this is something I'm not, like I said, I'm not opposed to this at all. Because I think part of this is really looking at, and I've talked with Evans and Jen can attest this, you know, really looking at technology. You know, it does frustrate me when I walk into classrooms. Sometimes I see students on a laptop learning math as opposed to a teacher teaching math and you know so that is a frustration of my so how, how do we shift away from that covid response to getting back to you know high quality research-based instructional methods in our classrooms you know and it's not occurring all, all across so we really have to look at the, the appropriate use of technology you know whether it be age appropriate you know it, 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 in our schools and i think a discussion really is around what role cell phones play but i think that's part of not just a discussion here and based on personal feelings, I think there's a there's a lot that you go through because if we look at really what you know we want for our kids, we're saying we want a high quality education, and that part of the high quality education is being tech free, that we're no longer going to have technology that's fine, but then we have to look at is well then what's the alternative and how do we do that? What's the training uh, around that? So I think there's a big discussion that's more than just at the board level. I think that you know so the board can. Ask admins, ask you know, like said, we or committee. There's all sorts of things we can do with this, but it's more that you know, it, 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 there's a lot of heavy lifting here. Eric, so I mean, I, I kind of, I'm kind of looking at this like, which I don't have a problem with technology. I think that's part of life. Part of in the real world, they're going to have to be using technology. We, I think we need to to teach prop, proper practices and with technology, and I mean. For example, when my daughter, Cora, first started school, I was, like, blown away because she did not have any textbooks. I, I couldn't believe that, that, that she was going to be taught without textbooks. But yet, she's a pretty bright kid. She, she's learned a lot from not doing things the way that I or other people have been taught. So, so I think I think it would be good if if there was there was some sort of committees where teachers, students, um, to to get buy-in from the students, where where we could figure out a way that that uh, this technology could be taught and utilized in in a good way to learn. You know, try to get rid of texting a friend, that sort of thing. But, but you're never going to get that out of there 100%. It's just impossible. So is there a next step here? Or, I mean, to me, I, personally, I'm going to say I think the whole thing was a knee-jerk reaction. One person came, and we all lost our minds. I, I'll, I'll say that. I mean, not that I don't think there's a problem with kids and cell phones, and I think building admin took, realized there was an issue, and they had already worked on it and had it in the handbooks before the person even came. Um, that's why it was so quickly handed to us, because handbooks were already done, and they were in the handbook. So I guess, personally, I just need to know, every time one person comes, 
is that going to become our focus point well again I don't think it was about the policies I, you know and procedures they were already in place it was more about the learning and and it would have been if, if you know and I take responsibility because I did make that into that but it was really about her saying the brain research out there about phones but I you know it'd be nice to have a longer conversation at some point maybe so what what are we looking as as the next step then for this conversation so can I just ask uh, make a request to the board I think one of the things I need from the SU board is the SU board needs to have it develop a new vision and mission for SU schools um, I think we have LEAD which I think if I ask board members I think most of them probably have no idea what LEAD even stands for I mean if I ask to write it down many of us may have no idea what the, what those four letters even mean you know uh, and, and this is something which has been in place for five years and the reason why I say is we have a vision or mission is because that becomes an anchoring uh, a found is a foundational statement that all decisions really work for that so if we are looking at say cell phone use or purpose use of technology it is in the framework of is this working towards a vision not just kind of random uh, decisions being made because just you know we, we think this is best it really it, it, I, I talk about this and you know and Jen the admin team we had this where we we're looking at developing a vision for student learning born out of the portrait of graduate as well as the uh, strategic plan and this vision becomes this anchor statement that all decisions around curriculum instructional practices all refer back to this but if we have that foundational statement that we that we had, that we believe in that we want that we you know then that becomes so as we look at uh, you know so a cell phone the purpose of technology we're making these decisions it really is round because we're moving towards this not just we're coming here we're coming here we're coming here and I think that's where it becomes so I, I, I have no problem I think you know I'd like to see more of our kids engage in experiential learning you know hands-on I think there's a lot that can be done but that has to operate within a, a framework and that's something which you know we as a board we can we go through is look at strategic plan we look at portrait or graduate we can look at the vision for student learning and really just talk about and either a we feel that lead still you know it, it hits a point but it doesn't but i think that's something where i think our su still our, our su board still is missing is we have not really developed a vision or a mission or we just we're, we're, it's kind of carried on so our decisions do at times well intended well but they they can be r random as opposed to working towards something. If this is what we're doing, this is what we're saying that our, our and it's all born out of student experience. This is what the student experience looks like for our kids in our SU schools, regardless of town, how is this going to help us achieve that? And that becomes a frame that people can't, you know, they may not like it, but they can't argue, you know, they can't disagree with it because that's how the, the board is moving towards. So if we would say, you know, whatever decision is on cell phones or technology, where that, that you know, it's moving us towards this, Thing. but right now we don't really have that thing we it's kind of just up there about well it's been, and, and like I said I'm not I'm not gonna sit there and say that cell phones are not a distraction I, they, they've been a distraction in, in you know, every school I worked at there they, they can be a they're a they're a blessing and they're a curse and there are you know they're a right develop there from a developmental standpoint there is a ton of research that I, I do not dis disagree with at all but I think you know we also have to look at digital citizenship also teaching you know how to you know be responsible and, I, and to be honest, I'm more, you know, sometimes I'm more concerned about the adults than about the kids when I see what's all on Facebook, on social media, how people are interacting as well. You know, so it's just, there's a lot in our communities around how we interact, how we handle technology. And so, so I think there's some, some great discussions, but I do think a, a missing piece still is this board, and maybe we wait till after the reorg and we have a new board in place and over there we really look at have that strategic plan at porch graduate and say we need a vision in which we you know roll on stakeholders and develop this and then as we make decisions you know that is a you know like this the piece that everything refers back to it's that north star that we have so, so let's do that let's let's do it let's create let's talk about a vision and a mission then that will lead into the strategic plan that will lead into the portrait of a graduate let's do that if that's what will pull us together I'm for it because I know that what we talked about at the VSBA was that they said everything on your agenda should point to your strategic plan 
everything should come from your strategic plan. So everything that you talk about has to do with well, how you're guided by your strategic plan. George? I, I think Chris brings up a really, really good point. Um, we've got the opportunity here to give some guidance to our students in the use of these devices in life. I, I see a lot of contemporaries, and I'm a little bit older, who have all of a sudden discovered Facebook and things like that, and um, I, I'm more concerned for them than I am for our students. Um, so that, that's a positive point we should put out there, that we can come up with ways to guide our students in the proper use of these things. Well, perhaps, perhaps we should have building admin share in a report or you could have them share in a report in your next January superintendent report about how digital citizenship is being taught um, at the different levels. I think maybe that's a missing point. I think that there's a... As well as an update of how their policies are going with that they instituted this year with the cell phones. Because I felt like at the end of our discussion a few months ago, whenever that was, when we had all the information mm -hmm. from the admin, that we all felt that it was already addressed, that cell phones were um, you know, not really being used much during school time, mm -hmm. um, and that they had policies in place if students... Or procedures. Eric wants yes, us to procedures. say procedures. Sorry, I meant procedures. <laughs> um, and we didn't feel like it was necessary to create an SU policy. policy at that time, but you know, hearing an update wouldn't be a bad thing, and then we can go from there. Um, and I, I don't mind working on a mission, whether it's next month or if we wait till March, but um, I, I agree that it's what we have doesn't real it doesn't really match with our portrait of a graduate. Right. So it would be great to kind of tie them together and make it stronger. Okay. So maybe, I don't know if we should do a subcommittee on that to work on it to present. Sure. Would you like to lead that subcommittee? Sure. Who else would like to? Linda? Anybody else? Eric? Eric? All right. That seems like enough. Sure. Okay. Anyone's Great. welcome. So we'll have a subcommittee with Tina, Linda, Eric, and Eric to bring back draft ideas for a vision, vision and mission uh, for the SU. Would it be better for that subcommittee to look at a process for developing a, a mission and vision? Because I do think stakeholder involvement is important sure. in this, and so therefore... Do you want to share, is there like a process or procedure you want to share with them? I mean, I, I, could, I could, you know, meet with them, I could attend these, I will be there. Okay. These, but I think it's something where uh, in developing a mission and vision, obviously we have, you know, the, the you know, it's, like I said, the vision for student learning is being born out strategic plan and portrait of graduates, which we've received feedback. We spent two years, you know, polling individuals, meet, meet with individuals. So, uh, it, you know, we, it's coming out of community feedback. Mm -hmm. But I think as we look at, this is a visionary statement in terms of where we want our SE schools to go. And, you know, like I said, we have and we put the cart before the horse, we have those documents in place, but it's also important to make sure that it's not seen as just it's a unilateral decision being made by one entity without input. I know that our last, I think that was kind of the sticking point was our last mission or vision was done in that capacity right. where central here's, office. here's where it is and then we just accepted it, which is why there's been very little to no real buy-in. I think, you know, people mm -hmm. will know it, but um, the, the vision really should be central to all decision makers. We're looking at budgeting, we're looking at staffing, we look at programming, we look at curriculum. It all refers back to that vision around that student experience. Is, is this going to assist us in moving in this direction? And I know when we met on the vision for student learning, that it becomes a, a, a critical piece. And I know Jen, she's so laughing when you say, but I, we talk all the time about the through line, but the yeah. through line really exists. It begins with the students, what that student experience is. And then it looks back, all right, so what do the teachers need to be able to do to provide that? Then what do the building administrators need to do to, to work with the staff to, to provide that? And then 
what, what the central office needs to do to support that, and then what does the board need to do to support all the other individuals ultimately to gain the student experience. But, uh, but I think that's, I, you know, I would love to see more of our discussions around these things rooted in a vision. So if we are talking about technology, it is re referring back to, look, if this is what our vision is, this is what we believe in, is this helping us move or advance us or not? As opposed to being done, and like I said, I'm, I'm not opposed or, or against whatever else. But I think the, the, the only issue I have is, is if, if what direction are we heading? Right. Because are we moving this way, or, move this, or are we moving all towards? And that vision provides that north star. We're funneling right back towards towards that. Right. And it's, uh, it's all about the students. Eric. So, so, and and you got to forgive me because I'm I'm new at this, but but. You know, you're looking at at a, a finished product approach to developing developing a vision, right? So, so you're if I was an industry, I would look at what I wanted to produce and work my plan backwards. So, would it would it behoove us to have input from from um, local professionals and tradespeople on what it is that that they're seeing from our students out in the field after they graduate. So, so I'm looking at like, I remember training people at GE and, and a lot of them didn't know what nominal meant. So, so it means middle, right? So I mean, there's, I, I think it would be a good approach because when you're in business, you're looking at what your customer needs. And then, and then you start from there and you work you work backwards to come to your 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 vision and strategic and tactical planning in order to achieve your customer, goal. Eric, is our customer the community or our customer the student? I think that's 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 our our, our end customer is the person who's going to hire our students. So right. So I, I think that's part of the whole process that those, these conversations will be had in terms okay. of as you gain input about you know, and I think that's where the portrait graduates. Really, you know, as we you know, when a student matriculates or you know leaves our system, whether it be at the age of eighth, eighth grade, or high mm -hmm. school, that these are the competencies that we feel are essential for them to have to be successful in whichever path they choose mm -hmm. in life, whether it be a career-based, <coughs> uh, post-secondary, you know, uh, academic career, whatever. That this is what we want them, and we we spent a lot of time. What does this look like? And I think that's something the discussion we've been having more this year is as we talk about programming. We talk about resources, we look at staffing, is this going to move us in this direction? And we, we had these conversations behind, behind the scenes, but I think it's as we develop this vision or mission, these are all, you know, and this will be a lot of feedback, a lot of, we can, but I think because at the end, when we adopt this, the community will have had, say, will have input, they, you know, we say prevent, prevent drafts, you know, present drafts to them for you know, <coughs> their input. Um, and it could be I go out to you know stake variety of stakeholders, right? And then that, but well, once we have that, then we could sit there and now say, as opposed to five years ago when I was adopted, this is a vision that has really been developed from the community across all of our, you know, and, and, you know, schools and you know and communities. So, as opposed to before. So. Okay. So I'll I'll plan to call a subcommittee meeting in January so that we can present something whether it's just where we're at or what we have in February. Sounds good. Um, so I was gonna, with, with the cell phone, I, I just one last final thought, and, and I like what Tina was saying about having additional information from uh, the building administrators, but um, I think that, you know, something important to think about though too is, you know, if, I was gonna suggest earlier maybe, you know, just, get a consensus right now if people want to pursue this or just drop it as it is and um, because it, again I just I, I don't want to you know beat a dead horse and and drag it out but um, you know one thing that you know I think about is when it comes to the cell phone like pros and cons you know and and I've already said it but my perspective is I see more cons and than, than anything with it so that's just something I just wanted to say before we move on. Oh, Eric, can I ask you, because I'm still confused as to what issue with cell phones, and I know Linda tried to provide a clarification we're really trying to address, because if we're looking at the distraction piece, um, you know, as we're asking for, you know, updates around the procedures, are the procedures working, uh, 
I, I would think that hopefully, you know, that we would ask Bill Ammon then to speak with staff about their recommendations, their concerns, the things they're seeing, and that if the board were going to move in a direction around that piece, it's born out of concerns that have been shared, you know, the staff has shared their concerns with the administration, administration, and then come back here, not just kind of a knee-jerk because we may be, you know, if, if we we're saying this direction where I'm saying, look, it has not been a distraction, we're okay, but yet we make this knee-jerk, we're gonna ban cell phone in school, now we create another whole battle for our teachers, and that's the thing is that teachers rely on the front line a lot of these situations. Um, you know, it, it's, it's spent a lot of time just battling, put your phone away, put this away, you know, give me your phone, you know, it, it just, it, it sets up a lot of problems in school sometimes. So I think we really have to think about what we want to do. If it's more about the tech aspect and about student learning, I think that's a bigger <coughs> discussion that uh, we as an SU just need to have and, and bring in, you know, said our uh, assistant superintendent in charge of curriculum instruction, uh, you know, our admins, our teachers are really start to talk about what, what that may look like. And so, yeah, so I, just, I, I just want some guidance because I know that when Tina had asked for and we have digital citizenship, like whatever we've done, and then we have an update on procedures. That's just, we're really looking at distractions and what we're doing is just, you know, around helping kids be responsible, you know, with it and make good decisions. But Yeah. Uh, no, I, I get all that. And, you know, just some of the things that, you know, as a distraction, but I think it's, part of it is, is, is access. So, I mean, you know, we hear that the kids can't have or students can't have the cell phones during you know, instruction time or class time. Um, but the time in between, you know, they have access. So I think, you know, for me, part of that is access, which um, uh, I, I understand, you know, where there's the argument, well, it's, it's non-instruction time or whatever. Um, but, you know, there's, there's, I don't know, I, a lot of variables in there where, where you know, between um, the social media, cyberbullying, and so, but, we, we, but I understand. But that's anecdotal. It goes back to we don't have evidence to make these statements right now because, you know, we're, we go back to the original was about the learning, and that's in the classroom. And so we, we, we look at social media. We found that, and I'll just say this, you know, and and, and Jen, other men, you know, the social media that's occurring is outside of school. You know, that we are finding that we're, well, on Monday mornings, we're dealing with things that occurred on Friday night or Saturday night. It's not happening necessarily in a lunchroom. It's not happening, you know, uh, you know the three-minute passing period. So I think that's where we really have to look at, and that's where, you know, before we start making statements, Eric, we have to really look at the data. And so if we are finding HHB investigations that are saying that, okay, that, you know, 60% of our HHBs were occurring <laughs> at this time, then we can sit there and say, okay, it's not just... We've identified school, you know, the, the classrooms are okay, but lunch has been a real problem. That's a different story. But I know that majority of the issues that we see or we have to deal with are done outside of school hours. That, you know, they come into school, we'll get phone calls with emails. Hey, my son received this or my, my child received this. Can, you know, can handle it. And we're dealing with something that occurred on a Friday night or a Saturday afternoon that had nothing to do, do with us. But yet it's worked its way into school and then the HHB becomes a very cumbersome process. It's time consuming. So I just want to make sure as we move forward, I'm, I, I said I'm not opposed to this, but we have to have data that sh supports what it is we're doing. And we have to be very careful with, you know, because it, it goes back to the original point was about learning. And so we're looking at classroom. It was not about distractions, about learning, about, you know, are, are these a distraction to learning? And then the, the outside of the classroom time, that's another whole discussion, but we don't have the data to even have that. I think that's something which if the board would like us to re take a look at cell phones, you know, look at the amount of times we, you know, uh, we've logged this and we look at you know, times we present that, we can have that information for the board to take a look at. That's fine. But I think we just have to be very careful just here because people are going to hear a part of what we're saying, not the whole thing, and say, oh, well, you know, it's a problem in, in, in the classroom. Or it's not a problem in the classroom, but a problem in lunchrooms. When it may not, that may be the case at all. When a kid just is on, on there and wants to watch like a, a, a video, which I'm not going to say is, is great or not, but you know that's how they're choosing to, you know, to occupy the time. And in some instances, that student, instead of doing that, is not maybe acting like a knucklehead and getting into trouble. <laughs> is actually more focused on that. So. 
question. We, we, like I said, we, we don't, don't know. It's a, that's why I said it's a very nuanced and very complex conversation that we have, but we also have to be very focused in what, what we're trying to accomplish with this because it's, it, it's just like opening, it's like put, pour a glass of water on a table, it, this could go all over the place. We have to be focused on what, we're, what we want to do with this. And that's all I'm asking is yeah. what information that you want from myself and the admins moving forward around this. Okay. That makes sense. I mean, what you're saying, so. So we're good with them bringing the, what's being used for, I'll say, digital citizenship, but it could be appropriate use of technology, <laughs> how it's being wordsmithed differently. And, and the data. Yeah, that the data, like how many incidents. Referral, were, yeah. How many dummy phones are being. Well, <laughs> we don't know that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's well, basically going to be referrals. That That's going to be the. Right. That's going to be the basis of it. So. All right. Sounds good. And also their take on, you know, how they feel about it being a distraction in the classroom. Right. And that. And as Jen said, that was why. And instructors had come and that's why they had it in place for the handbooks for this year so so it'd just be good to hear throughout that yeah. you Thank okay you. all right can we take um recess for 10 minutes and then we'll come right back okay just because all the food is out there oh <laughs> oh, oh okay okay yeah you can fix I'll bring it in here you can fill a plate and then we I can will leave the link open and then we'll this. listen to the strategic plan while we eat so we're going to go into the um, strategic plan and Chris is going to give a update Uh, so I did put a copy of this into the board shared folder. I know this is uh, back in August uh, when we reviewed the strategic plan. Uh, you had the same document to it. So just out of, uh, for continuity's uh, sake, we just decided to keep the same document and just add highlights and updates. And then what we will do is uh, in April, when we provide our, our updates in April, we'll just continue to add. So you'll, you'll see the updates from December as well as April and then uh, June. Okay. So it will, the document will get longer um, as, uh, as we move, on, move forward, but it's, it, there's a reason why we're doing this way. Uh, so as most of you remember, you know, know, the past two years really have been spent on developing the Portrait Graduate Studio Plan, which we did talk about during the, uh, the cell phone discussion, which uh, um, about the, the importance of these, these two documents and it's really, uh, uh, it does serve that North Star, and I know that as Eric had talked about, we, we look at graduates and the skills and the competencies. Uh, these are what you know, after meeting with students and staff and, and community members, and uh, you know, we kind of settled on these these competencies and what this really you know meant. Our strategic plan then was formed out of well, how are we going to do this? What does this you know look like? And that's where we moved into our core values and so you know I, I should give you the quiz but there is what lead stands for and there's the mission which is just a reiteration of the vision uh, and then as you remember our strategic plan settled on three main priority areas around academic success school climate culture and then community engagement and communication within each of these priority areas we then identified uh, goals and initiatives and I'm not going to go through all the initiatives with you uh, tonight. We've already been through this. Uh, you have access. But what I like to do is just kind of talk about some of the highlights and updates. And I just want to remind everyone that we are about six months into a five-year plan. Uh, so, you know, obviously at the end of this strategic plan, this is where we want to be. And we are not going to be there tonight. We are on our process. And there will be some things like, well, are we going to do this? Are we going to do that? There are a lot of things that, yes, we still are, are going to do. And what in our update in April and in June, we'll talk more about year two and year three, uh, but we really wanted to get year one kind of underneath us, see where we're at. Uh, and then we, you know, it's important for us in April and, and June to really talk about year two and three, particularly as we look at budgeting. 
And, you know, but that's where I talk about the importance of having visions and these documents in place because, you know, as we have to make hard decisions, the decisions will really be around strategic planning, portrait of graduates, our, our vision. Uh, so, so as you look at highlights and updates for this, uh, so with the first thing under the first uh, the academic says goal one, we have improved academic achievement and student growth at all grade levels in the areas of literacy and math. So as of now, some of the highlights and updates that we have. First, we have a core day curriculum. So uh, you remember in November, uh, there was a GRCSU board presentation uh, made by our assistant superintendent <coughs> and uh, Proctor High School principal, Jennifer McLemore, who uh, you know, developed a plan for you know, uh, a, a more coordinated curriculum across the SU. Uh, one of the things that we've talked about, and I'm not gonna talk about every bullet point in length, but there'll be some that will, is the importance of this curriculum. And that uh, you know, we're not looking at lockstep you know, in every single school that you know, on day one, all third graders were doing the same thing, but it's important for us to really look at uh, you know, curriculum that is research-based, that is, uh, you know, providing the, you know, yielding the results that we are looking for and making sure that that's occurring in all of our schools. And there is that vertical and horizontal alignment. And that's what, you know, the plan that uh, Lisa and Jen have presented will, it will begin, uh, begin with. And it, it is a daunting process. One of the things I did talk with, with Jen and Lisa about also is the importance of developing a, what's called a, uh, a curriculum cycle map. And so, uh, and I think maybe, you know, in, in, at the next update or in, in, later in the spring, Jen and Lisa will provide a, a, a map for the board. So you see, you know, uh, having worked in districts where typically it's between three to five years, if there's a five-year plan for cur curriculum, all curriculum in the, in, in the SU at some point in time or, you know, a year is always on one of those same columns, so year one or year five. So you can continually see where, a, so if you're like, well, where's a third grade ELA curriculum? Well, that's in year three right now. Here's what's happening in year three. Where's the, uh, the algebra one curriculum? Well, that's in year four. Uh, you know, and so you can see exactly where everything's at in this cycle. So when the question was asked, well, then once we have this curriculum, are we done? We're never really done, but it's this continuous stage of, you know, you do uh, you know, data reviews, curricular reviews, you know, alignment. Uh, you know, and so it works it through this cycle, but it gives a visual for the board, for staff, for community members to really understand where Kirk was at. And this is a very important piece for us because at the heart of academic achievement, student growth really is making sure that we have a strong, effective curriculum that meets the needs of all learners across you know, the spectrum uh, and is aligned to our standards as well as the standards that are assessed on you know, the VIT cap and, and, and the things along those lines. So, uh, so that's, that's an important piece there. Uh, so we've, we've, we've run that process. We've also looked at uh, teachers uh, systematically evaluated common performance indicators and engaged in reflective discussions based on data within PLC groups. Uh, and so basically what that means is just as we look at the curriculum that you know, we're, we're really looking at performance indicators and we are looking at, you know, is it, you know how well we're doing, uh, we're looking at the data support, and then if there's something that we're missing, uh, then how can we improve our curriculum, how can we improve our instruction, our unit plan. So there's a lot of great discussions occurring at, you know, with our, our classroom teachers and our building administrators around data and, you know, you know and, and I guess, you know, being responsive to that. Uh, we're also looking at in cl initiated collaborative teacher work groups to enhance educational practices as part of the PLC. Uh, one of the, there are many pros and cons to small schools, and we have small schools in our SU. One of the cons is the fact that around collaboration. When I worked in a suburban high school back in Illinois, I had close to 30 some individuals, uh, you know, in our English department. So I had a lot of opportunities to collaborate. When I was, you know, teaching, say, freshman English or junior English, I had seven or eight other individuals just within my school alone that I could collaborate with. We may find that a lot of our schools don't have that access, don't have that luxury, so they may be the third grade teacher and they have no one else to talk with or they may you know the, you know the the algebra one teacher in their their school and so we want to continue to find ways that our staff can you know collaborate within their districts and across the SU just to better align curriculum and uh, performance indicators and and also just if you're seeing successes what are some of these successes mm -hmm. uh, and, and also you know if there's areas of growth we can identify that uh, we've also executed a pilot program for the University of Florida Literacy Initiative, UFLY. It's just an intensive reading program. We've, talk, we've talked about that. Uh, I know that uh, Rutland Town had uh, a, you know, a classroom teacher come and present and kind of give you an example of what a UFLY lesson looks like and foundations. So 
you know, and I think that's something which we would like to do also beginning after January is start to have more teachers present at the SU board to so talk about some of these things that they're doing. Uh, and you, you, know, you can see it, you know, community members can see this and you can ask questions about how well things are going. A couple of years ago, we did schedule a literacy audit in uh, NRSU. It was, it was uh, eye-opening for a lot of us around the amount of literacy programs we had coexisting at the same time, which you know uh, was well intended, but also part of the problem. Uh, we've also are looking at you know in the winter of 2023, so starting probably in January, it's actually be 2024. We will be doing a comprehensive math audit, which we're really taking a look at the programs you know at, at, across. Our K through 12 spectrum and what, what is we're doing, and we look at then uh, what our next steps will be. Will help us better understand because we do see that as you know we get the feedback from our our VitCap and uh, we look at our proficiencies. <coughs> our students struggle in math, and we want you know we want to take a look at it, make sure that we have the best curriculum in place that is uh, yielding both positive results for our, for our students. Uh, as along the same lines, we did ex uh, extend access to the all learners online subscription platform to all K through 8 teachers. And what this uh, All Learners Online does is provide opportunities for you know, math teachers to look at high, uh, highly effective math instructional approaches, uh, creative ways to reach all learners. So as we look at differentiation, there's professional development. So it's a, it's a nice resource for our classroom teachers to have. And this goes back to that collaboration standpoint is, you know, they don't have a, a wealth of individuals to kind of collaborate. This, this is also just another uh, resource for them to access it if, if, if they need. Uh, implemented FastBridge assessment tools across the entire SU K-39 system. We've talked about that. The FastBridge now is our assessment they're using, using to monitor growth in our schools. Um, and then we've conducted faculty training sessions on understanding FastBridge, data interpretation, and progress monitoring. And I think what's important about understanding FastBridge, uh, just as well as we'll look at understanding VitCap, uh, there, there's a lot to uh, these assessments. And I think, you know, for classroom teachers that just really have to understand what uh, what these assessments are looking at, you know, and uh, you know, and uh, the type of uh, the, the way they're assessing the learning. And I bring this up because there's uh, there's what's called Webb's depth of knowledge, and it's, it's, a, it's a different levels of questions that you, you know you're going to ask. And uh, it's Webb's DOK, but they typically are linked to a lot of these high stakes assessments like VitCap, or, you know, uh, uh, the SBAC before. You know, most of the national assessments are linked to this. And the reason why I say this is because in a classroom, a classroom teacher could be looking at a level two assessment. Um, you know, they design a level two assessment and they say, hey, these kids are doing great. They're proficient. They're doing really well. No problems at all. But when they, you know, take the, you know, the VitCap, the VitCap might be assessing them at, say, a level three or a level four. And so then the teacher's like, well, you know, every, every document that I have is a kid, kid student's proficient, but yet, the VitCap come back and say they're they're not proficient, and so what we're really taking a look at is just understanding these these <coughs> tools a little bit better, so therefore we can align our assessments. So if VitCap is assessing say to level three, then we should be looking to replicate that you know, in, within our classroom. So therefore we have a much better understanding uh, of that. And I think that's where it goes down to that last bullet point around the formative assessment methodologies. VitCap has or Cogna has opened up these formative assessments that can be used throughout the course of the year to get a better understanding of where our kids are at. It's not just, like I said, a, the, the, the assessment that's given in the spring is a one, it's like a snapshot at that moment in time, but the formative will give us a better understanding, at, you know, as, you know, so teachers can select individual indicators or standards to drill down and see how well they're doing. And so if, if students are struggling with a specific ad, you know, indicator, they can look at, well, what, is there a different approach or what can I take? or or if another student's doing well, they can then begin to differentiate in the classroom and work on, say, a small group and, uh, and work with someone else. Mm -hmm. uh, along the same goal, uh, we also have GRSSU and service initiatives, uh, diverse areas, curriculum assessment, and strategic plan development, uh, specifically focusing on integrating reading and writing across the uh, curriculum. Uh, once we have that math on it, we obviously we will be looking to incorporate math as well, uh, what that looks like in a, a variety of our classrooms. We've facilitated literacy and math book study groups to deepen educators' understanding of print subjects. Um, because, uh, it's along the middle school, and that's something which is part of the five-year plan, is really understanding the unique needs of a middle school group of uh, uh, students. And as someone who worked in middle school for many, many years, uh, I think Part of it is we, we have to understand that that age band, I know some people say five through eight, some say six through eight. 
we're splitting hairs, but that middle school band, it's a, it's a unique need in terms of academic, social, emotional. And so we're really looking at in our schools across the SU, are we doing everything we need to really meet those needs of those, those students, those learn? You know, I mean, obviously in five years we can take a look at structurally if we want to make some adjustments or changes, but within our current setup, we want to make sure that, let's say at, uh, at one of our high schools, at Pulteney High School, that the seventh graders are not being taught the same way as a junior in high school. It's, it's a completely different approach mm -hmm. and making sure that our teachers have a good understanding of that. And, and, and Pulteney is a good example because there are some strong uh, middle school educators over there who understand the unique needs of that band, but we want to make sure it's across the, uh, the SU. And so what we had was all of our schools became a member of the New England League of Middle Schools, and we are going to send some representation to the, uh, the spring conference. Uh, we won't send all of our admins there, uh, represent, we'll start to take a look at really what this means. And, and, and that's, you know, I said this emphasis, because for me that middle school is a critical, I mean, the, uh, they're all critical years, don't get me wrong, but <clears throat> I think what we really look at from a pathways perspective, you know, it's at, at five through eight, from a, you know. A, we can yeah. lose kids at five well, through eight. Correct. Yeah. <coughs> and I think that's what we don't want to do is we want, instead of losing kids, we want to yeah. grab hold of them and also help them, you know, chart a path forward. Yeah. Uh, you know, so. Uh, along that same line, like I said, we have had book, uh, book studies. The administrators are uh, reading the book Magic in the Middle, focus on, or the 7th through 12th administrators uh, around that. Uh, the next two bullet points are on MTSS, uh, multi-tiered system of supports. Uh, our elementary uh, age, you know, group, uh, last year was year one, they did a deep dive, went all in on this. Uh, we learned a lot from last year. We made some adjustments, and you know, we were in year two with our MTSS system in our elementary schools. Uh, I've heard uh, a lot of positive feedback. We're starting to see you know, a lot of positive gains uh, around identifying students early. You know, looking at uh, just uh, you know through the, the cycles and looking at data and uh, and what can be done to really meet you know, best meet the needs of our students. Um, and we're now looking at what that looks like in the secondary. And I think that's you know someone who's worked in high schools and uh, middle school majority of my career. Uh, I know that it, sometimes it kind of falls off the plate once a student gets to high school, but we really want to look at, we want to make sure that we're not, you know, missing the boat with them as well, that they need uh, an MTSS system. So it's, it's a little bit different than our elementary, as it should be, but it's still the same uh, goal and intent. So we're, we're working with our, our admins and our staff on uh, enhancing that as well. Uh, and then obviously targeted pro uh, professional learning development sessions uh, around PLC meetings to, to support interventionists and deliver an effective intervention. So uh, as we know, we did shift away from instructional coaches and we went in with the interventionists. Uh, we want to make sure our interventionists are, are looped in to, uh, to collaborate with classroom teachers, around EST, MTSS, they're an integral uh, piece in terms of what we're doing, uh, you know, around all this, so. All right, any questions around that before I move on to the next goal? Okay, I'm glad you guys ate already, so. <laughs> um, so goal two, uh, expand enrichment and post-secondary opportunities for all pre-K through 12th grade students. And I, I, I just want to remind everyone, we're, we're six months in, so mm -hmm. we have a long way to go. So we have plans, but we're just, like I said, we're, we're not, you know, not even a, a year, through year one. Uh, we are in the process of compiling comprehensive lists of community partners, extracurricular activities, and diverse opportunities to enrich student experiences. Uh, it's something which we are identifying where, the, where gaps are, what, what some potential possibilities are, and I know that in each one of our schools, it presents, poses some different issues and problems, but that's something which we will, will kind of work through and discuss uh, how we can best handle that. Uh, but we want to make sure that our students have access to a wide variety of activities and, and opportunities both <coughs> during the school day and after the school day as well. Uh, we uh, look at a, uh, collaborative discussions among administrators uh, regarding upcoming enrichment programming and shared experience across different buildings. We did have a, uh, uh, you know, uh, Proctor High School had a, uh, the, the, it was like a math carnival, I, I apologize, Jen, for if I butchered it, but uh, had an event in which all the uh, SU schools were invited to attend. And I think what our admin have <laughs> done, have had some really good conversations around developing more SU experiences for our students. Uh, so not just, you know, so if there's something that's being offered at, say, at one of the polling schools or, or uh, Middletown or Wells, that we can somehow incorporate all SU students in, uh, into this. And so we are looking at some, uh, you know, uh, some opportunities, you know, uh, for after winter break as well as for the springtime around SU-based. So we'll, we'll have more information for you with that. But that is uh, important for us. They did organize the 
getting to the Y program, which is attended by students in grades 7 through 12. And this, this is in partnership with Up for Learning. And really what, the, the, I guess the, the main crux of this program is it's around, uh, it's, a, it's a behavioral, like a, at youth risk, but it, it, so students will take the survey, you know, and then it helps students understand, better understand where they're at, who they are, and then what, what the next steps are. So, you know, so if someone's dealing with some anxiety or some stress, or some of, they look at some proactive strategies that uh, a student can do to, 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 you know, to work through that. And I, so I, you'll hear a lot about getting to the why, uh, we, we, that's part of that social emotional that the state is asking us to really take a look at, but, uh, but it's not just us doing something, that getting to why helps us be more responsive, but it also you know, uh, allows the students to have a little bit of agency and voice in this as well, because they are really looking at their results and their data and, and helping you know, say, well, here's what I need, and then uh, we'll be responsive to those needs. Uh, I, we've implemented a dedicated career and college course for all 10th grade students, <clears throat> so that, that's a required course. It, it's being held opposite of our driver's education course. Uh, so instead of, uh, it, it's, we're going to look, you know, obviously at the end of this year we'll look at how well this went and why not we want to expand this. Uh, I, I do, and I'll just say this personally, <clears> 10th <throat> grade it's great, but I also think we need to be doing things earlier. Uh, sometimes, you know, 10th grade can be, you know, if someone gets, you know, spring of their 10th grade year, Sometimes you know, they're already you know chasing the eight ball. I mean, a lot of other kids are, are well on the path. So I think it's a great first step for us. But I think one of the steps we'll take a look at with our our Corey Valley admins and, and school counselors is how do we place it in a more appropriate place? And I, I know I think it's great that they do this, but I know the reason why they put a tenth grade was to fill in that gap with driver's ed. But I really think now the next step will be okay. You know, where does it more appropriately belong, particularly with our our students? Um, we. <clears throat> We have the uh, continuity of career cafes with, within high schools. So for those who are not familiar with the career cafe, <clears throat> this was started years ago. Um, it, there's a woman by the name of Deborah Singheiser now works with the VSBA, uh, was working, initially began working with Proctor High School and then expanded to working with our Corrigan schools. A career cafe, uh, really what it boils down to is it brings in individuals <coughs> from the community, from various careers and jobs, and then it gives the students an opportunity to kind of talk to them about, you know, their, their, their profession, the career, you know, with the path they took, you know, the education needed. Uh, so it is a good opportunity for some of our kids to engage in those conversations. Um, you know, uh, we're, you know it, it's great that we're still doing this. We, it's been done in all of our schools, you know, at West Rutland, Proctor, and Pulteney. Um, but we're also looking at how do we, you know, continue to expand this. So uh, we have a local reach. Is there a way to have it more, uh, you know, like I said, regional or, or nationwide? And, and well, that, you know, it, it can be done virtual. You know, we, we've seen that there are some pros and cons with that, but there might be some outreach if, you know, someone's interested in aerospace engineering that we can, you know, uh, connect with someone in Boeing or, or you know, and, but they won't, obviously Boeing's not going to fly someone in to, to, to one of our communities, but there might be a way for them to connect uh, in a virtual way. So we're looking at just how to continue to expand that for our, for our students. Excuse <coughs> me. Uh, and along the lines, obviously, professional development sessions for counselors, focus on the plan, execution of K-12 career fairs. And a lot of this really is, Deborah Singer did a lot of great, uh, did a lot of great things for our students. But we also knew that that would be ending um, because of, you know, once again, Esser and sunsetting. <coughs> and so we're looking at how do we build out capacity with our counselors to continue and take this on. And that's what, you know, this kind of highlights that we've, we've begun that process of, um, building out capacity with our counselors to continue to to, to do this and move it forward. Uh, PLPs have always been a part of our process during COVID. They kind of fell by the wayside a little bit. We're obviously we're bringing them back, but what we've also done we've expanded our PLPs by incorporating a specialized career development section to enhance students' career awareness and planning. And one of the key aspects of this that we have to make sure we're is as students are ident identifying early on through their PLP that, <clears throat> you know, this is what they like to do or what the path, we have to make sure that we're providing them with opportunities. And I think it's going to provide us, particularly at, say, Cory Valley, because that's where you know, a lot of these you know, secondary experiences would be, is how do we creatively provide these opportunities for our students, whether it be in-house or uh, in another way. But it, it gives us a lot of feedback through this. But this also goes back to... <clears throat> 10th grade and, and the PLP, PLPs that began much earlier than 10th grade, so we just have to align that a little bit better. 
And then the last thing is that uh, across the SU, we have introduced the Harvest of the Month and Healthy Foods A through Z program, uh, which just emphasize local produce, nutritional information, and food preparation skills. And uh, I know our admins and our students, uh, you know, uh, think, think this is a great program. And, um, and they we're, we're continuing next year with the use of uh, with ESSER funds as well. So, all right, um, at least part of the year. Goal number three, and I know Bill is still on here, so Bill might be able to talk about some of this, but um, if there are any questions, they may respond. So improve and expand continuum services for special education students to include GRCSU-based alternative programming options to meet the range of needs of learners across GRCSU schools. So we know that, uh, and this is something which we were talking about today at, at, their, uh, uh, at our VSA VASBO um, workshop, is there there is just a dearth of alternative programming for our students uh that's just a, it's a state problem there's just uh whatever is out there the, the seats fill <coughs> rather quickly it's just it's, it's it's difficult to do so um i know and bill presented this last spring you know we are in that pilot program and i think in you know uh, you know march will will present and then the you know the SU board will talk about whether or not we want to see this continue or not that will be a more decision but uh, we have, uh, we you know, brought this program. Well, Bill, do you want to quickly just talk a little about the program? You might be able to speak a little bit better about this than I can. Yeah, sure. I'll, t I'll, I'll take over, Chris. You've been around talking quite a bit. You probably use a drink of water at this point. Thanks, Bill. Um, yeah, so we are, as you know, we did um, open up the Wellness Center, which is, um, you know, it's always difficult to uh, start a new program. Um, you know, we have a lot of uh, logistics from our staff, a lot of work. It's been working great for students. Um, couldn't be more happy with student success. Um, I have been meeting with um, 7 through 12 administration, um, you know, basically Rutland Town and our three high schools, uh, about 7 through 12 programming. That's something that we put in the strategic plan that we, we need to address next and we need to become more unified as a district. So we started that. Um, you know, with that and becoming more unified, we have to look at transportation. Uh, we are a, a rather large geographical district uh, and going across it, but you know, we are going to have good, uh, robust programming. It, it needs to be in one location, and we need to bring the students there. So we, we've uh, begun a little bit. We're doing uh, some local transportation, and um, and so uh, working with Joe Harrington on that. Uh, but mainly the building principles. Um, so that's uh, you know we are just at uh, I, I, you know still feels like the beginning of the year, but I guess it's December. But we're working on that, and, and we are hoping to uh, do some type of pilot program seven through twelve next year. And you know, certainly we're hoping, we're hoping to keep the uh, wellness center uh, going as well uh, as it has been beneficial to students. Thanks, Bill. All right, moving on. So, so we then move into the second priority area. Uh, <coughs> academic success is pr probably the, the bulk of the strategic plan, so these will be rather quick. But uh, so we look at hire, retain, and build the capacity of highly effective staff members. You know, as we are in December, we are looking at obviously, you know, uh, updating job descriptions, uh, and also you know we're looking at alignment. I think one of the issues that we found uh, is just that we've had employees in each of our districts who are doing the same job but have different titles, and so it's really aligning job descriptions and job <coughs> titles uh, across. So there's not a confusion around a. Uh, like a behavioral support or a behavioral <coughs> interventionist. Uh, and so just making sure that we are use that same language. And I know that's something which we'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit later really about that, you know, the district staffing, SU staffing, and, you know, uh, we handle that. But, um, but the job description and, and titles are important. That's one of the first things we, we take a look at. Uh, the building administrators have been working with Shannon <coughs> Moriarty on this, but they have a weekly showcase. Uh, in which they uh, each week they, they feature a different staff member um, for for a variety of reasons about their you know, contributions to SU, but uh, you know these typically are featured on web websites as well as social media platforms. Uh, so it's just a way for us to recognize uh, there are some things we have in place for you know spring as well as end of the year, but we'll talk more about that in April um, around you know staff and rec rec recognition and updating. But uh, right now that's said so these are two things we're working on or I've worked on. Uh, with a second goal around school climate culture, on improving students' well-being <coughs> experience in our schools, <clears throat> we're looking at increasing opportunities for students to learn strategies to improve their well-being, obviously getting to the why and 
um, other things. We also look at the improve. You know, I, I do believe in having worked, as, like I said, a variety of schools. Uh, the importance of uh, a, a, a richer offering of extracurricular activities and programming, I think, also uh, uh, you know assists in students' well-being. I think you know a lot of times if a student feels a connection to a school, whether it be through you know, a, a club, a sport, a fine art, or you know a program, uh, I think you, you see you know the, the <coughs> academics will improve as well as behaviors will, will decrease. If a student feels no connection, I think that's uh, you know part of the problem we, we see. So. We just have to make sure that we really are looking at um, one identifying, you know, that uh, you know, it, it, providing students have that connection to the schools, but also as students recognize, you know, when they're, um, uh, you know, when they're having a tough day, what you know, or how to handle certain things. It's like, you know, anxiety and stress are things, particularly you know, high school students experience for a variety of reasons. They start to think about post-secondary. Uh, you know, sophomore year is always the funny year because the first first semester of sophomore year. They're just goofy kids, and they just you know don't have care in the world. Then all of a sudden, they, they, something happens in January. It's like, oh, I better get serious now. And then you start to see stress. <clears throat> Students start to get stressed out. And I think we just want to make sure that we have the resources to support them, but also we we you know, give them the the tools to to navigate uh, some of those uh, emotions and experiences as well. Uh, you know, increase access to meaningful, relevant programs. It's what I just talked about. Uh, expand authentic involvement of students in school-based programming. Uh, this is something which we are really looking at is as we build out uh, programming, whether it be extracurricular activities, you know, or academic, is really just getting more student feedback and student input in terms of what they would like to see. Um, this does cause a bit of a problem because we, you know, we, we hear some kids, well, I'd like to play lacrosse, and you know, well, you know, well, can we offer lacrosse? <coughs> you know, it, it, it's at the high school, or or I like to have this, uh, but I think we have to really take a look at is. How do we meet the needs of our students and have these conversations and discussions and, and bring them back to boards for uh, conversations as well? We're also looking to you know, increase opportunities to celebrate, acknowledge student contributions and achievements, and that's something which we are looking at uh, a variety of things we can do on a uh, regular basis as well as a, um, a monthly and annual basis. Because I think we have a lot of our students who do a lot of great things <coughs> over the course of the year that kind of fly under the radar, and I think it's important for us to celebrate uh, some of these things and. Um, you know, while you know, for for some for some of us it may seem like a small trivial thing, but for that student, it, it means the world to them. And a recognition that you know, it could be just you know, you know, lights that fire a little bit more, and that that student you know is walking down a different path. So it's important for us to just to really see you know and identify those and and uh, to do a better job of that. Chris, can I? Um, <coughs> yes. Uh, I just want to mention something which I shared with Tina. I thought it was really cool. Um, <coughs> but when you talk about. Uh, um, accomplishments and things. So my local high school that I graduated with, they post on their social media the cumulative GPA of the football team, which was like 3.3 .3 or something like that, which I thought was great because really put in perspective what the true goal is, you know. So, right. and, um, so I just wanted to share that when talking about accomplishments and, and applauding the students. So. Well, and, you know, and I'm not saying this, you know, but we have to understand that in our schools, the likelihood of our students, that, you know, making a living off being a professional athlete is, is slim to none. And that, that's just the reality of the, the numbers. And I think we have to, you know, <clears throat> it goes back to your saying about that student athletes is preparing them. Well, it's, they have a great experience, you know, that they, they enjoy it. And for a lot of them, it, you know, their, their athletic career ends, you know, uh, too soon. Um, but but really is just you know emphasize the importance of they are they are student athletes and to make sure that they, uh, they you know keep their priorities in line and how we can assist them with that here. Thanks, Tim. Uh, and so a couple of things obviously just uh, with the students' well-being we have the MTSS uh, just like I said you know is helping us investigate programs and opportunities. Uh, EST teams uh, you know formulating plans to enhance student well-being. Uh, and then the um, part of the getting the why uh, th we just had the survey on November seventh, uh, so the next step will be the um, we do a data analysis retreats, uh, look at a community dialogue nights, so we can you know figure out you know how best to, you know you know share this with uh, community with parents with students, act steps as well as a celebratory event for our students, and that's part of our, it's up for learning. That's what they it's all part of their program and resource with that. So. Uh, last priority areas around <coughs> engagement and communication. 
uh, provide clear and consistent communication within and from our GRCSC schools. You know, there's implementation of newsletter uh, communication across all GRCSC schools to enhance information. Uh, we're looking at uh, you know, ongoing training for admin and building interventionists, focusing on the utilization of assessment aggregators uh, with a spe specific emphasis on edge climber. Really, what it, you know, it, it's kind of a term there, assessment aggregator. It, it, uh, it really is just in fact, it, 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 like edge climber <coughs> is a you know, one stop, like a holistic data dump, for lack of a better expression, where it really gives us a, a good idea of where students are at, what interventions are necessary, wh where we're at with plans. And so like an aggregator is something which just allows us to better identify. So you may use an aggregator with, uh, as we're looking at <coughs> student performance, proficiency, uh, then we look at an aggregator, which I, you know, links like instructional approaches or teaching strategies, which are effective, which aren't. So we're, we're looking at using more data, and that's important, important across you know, from central office all the way down the classroom, really looking at data around uh, make our decision making, uh, you know, and, uh, how we're going to move forward. Um, and then, you know, uh, we talked about this before, but the <coughs> grade seven through nine teachers, uh, the effective use of fast bridge assessments, and particularly around the, both the form, you know, the formative assessments as well as understanding, um, uh, you know, what what those you know, what those look like, and not just, and I think that's something which I think the board had is it well has asked for and will ask for is when we come back in the winter, the mid-year, and we start to see, here's fall, here's winter, it's great to see where we're at, but the, the important piece in conversation is, well, what are our plans? <coughs> what are we going to do? So if we are trending in the right direction, <coughs> how do we continue to move in that direction? If we see a, you know, a, you know we're going the other way, well, how, what, what steps are we going to take? You know, you know what, what are the results? What are the reasons behind that? And then we, we have a plan, it's not just say, well, it's just a rough day for our kids. You know, that may be the case, but still, you know, we, we should have a, a, a very clear understanding in terms of where we're at, but that's just making sure that all of our staff just are aware of what the fast bridge sets means, provide an opportunity to review data in a timely fashion, and also giving them time to collaborate as well as to begin making plans with uh, the group as well as the building administrators. Um, and then the second goal, ensure meaningful <coughs> engagement with parents and students. Uh, you know, we have obviously proficiency-based grading during the fall of 2023. Um, there's the uh, parent-teacher conferences were conducted. Um, we're looking at sustained collaborative partnerships with Up for Learning, getting to the why, facilitate open house events and orientation to engage and inform parents and students. And we're looking at uh, continued collaboration with external organizations such as PTO and booster clubs. Obviously, like I said, this goes back to there, there's a lot more for us to do. So there are a lot of things for us to look at this six months in. Six <coughs> months in. One of the things we, we have to also understand and realize too, and this is we're not meant to, is we also operate under a collectively bargained agreement. And so while we say, hey, let's have a community night, sounds great, but we also have a collectively bargained agreement in place that say <coughs> that, you know, our staff will only work a certain number of nights. That if we're going to ask them to do something else, it's, you know, like I said, we did not collectively bargain for that. So therefore, we have to look to compensate. Or, and I bring this up because, you know, there are times when people have great ideas, but I don't want in any way for the staff ever to feel vilified because they're saying, look, this was not collectively bargained. And, and I, I bring that because a lot of times, we, you know, people say, well, community, like, let's have a community potluck. It sounds great. Or let's have a, a movie night. Or let's have this. There are a lot of great evening events that we would want to, you know, to have. But at the same time, as we have to understand is we're still operating under a collectively bargain that, that you know, the board as well as you know the, the association both <coughs> agreed on. So if we are looking at these things, we have to look at navigating within the constraints of the agreement, you know, or looking at you know making some alterations to that. And I, I, I bring that up just because it, it has popped up. Um, like, oh, we can just have this. And like, well, we, we can't just have this. We have to understand, you know, <coughs> it's also about being respectful. I said it was something which, you know, we you know, collectively bargained. So, um, and the last goal, uh, community partnership and involvement that provides students with life, academic, career, and service learning. You'll see a lot of this has already been talked about, uh, healthy foods, A to Z. Um, we have up for learning, getting to the Y, career cafes. Uh, we are looking at developing um, uh, more community partnerships uh, with, with stakeholders to enhance student experiences about what can be done. We, you know, we, we have seen instances in the past, but it's been kind of sporadic and really been out of community outreach. I know that uh, I had an opportunity last spring to meet with some 
Poultney community members who were looking at doing some some outreach, uh, particularly with Poultney High School students for around after school programming. Um, but I think we want to have a, a, a more consistent approach across our all of our schools in the SU about what they may look like and you know, identify, <coughs> uh, particularly around student experiences. And that's also the promotion of a, a, a very, you know more extracurricular clubs activities um, to foster more of student development. And, and I, I would love to see a stronger fine arts department in our schools. You know, particularly around you know just you know, I, I see a strong marching band, uh, mm -hmm. you know, theater department. Uh, you know, I know that I worked at school and I had show choir and uh, and I tell you what, there are a ton of kids involved in show choir. There, many kids are involved in show choir that were on the football team. Uh, so just, to, but I think that's something which we ought to take a look at is how do we do this across not just our schools or districts but across the SU, and, and so I, and that's something which we, <coughs> we, we tend to think in buckets like okay, this is our, our district, but we really there are opportunities across the SU for programming as well that we you know, over the next five years we should be looking at, um, and that it's also the expansive Richmond opportunities um, and as I said shared individual tailored offerings. <coughs> All right. I do believe that's it. So the next update will be uh, April 2nd uh, for <clears throat> us, uh, and then the uh, we'll have an update July 2nd. But in the April, I think we'll um, get a better understanding about where we're looking at year two, year three. We'll, we'll provide that update for you as well. And then July will just be a confirmation of that. <clears throat> uh, you know, end of the year, we'll also take a look <coughs> at uh, some reflective practice around some things we did and what we learned and if there are any adjustments or alterations to your plan we will share that in July with you right. any questions yes sir uh, yeah so going back to um, the the newsletter uh, I just was that is that um, um, just sent out to all parents or is that something where uh, people go and sign up for for a newsletter or is it just paper so right now we have a newsletter that's sent out to uh, any parents that are in our um, in our listing uh, that's something which we can take a look at if we would look to expand I know that uh, there have been other schools that if you want to be a on a list there's a link on the website you can sign up for that <coughs> website so that's something which we can take a look at doing uh, just to expand more community Involvement. So if there's someone who doesn't have a child in school but would still like to see what's going on in school, that they could get that newsletter. Okay. I was I, just curious how. Yeah, no, how, I, that's, yeah. I, how I, I, yeah. <laughs> and then going back to the, the the climate culture, is there any plans to do like student um, climate surveys or anything like that? Okay. Yeah. So Eric, as I said, we're we're okay. six months into a five-year plan, <laughs> and so yes, yeah, so, I mean surveys are going to be a part of this. We're, we're we're getting a lot of feedback, so. In, in April, you'll see that we'll have, there'll, be, there'll be community surveys that'll be going out, there'll be staff surveys, student surveys. We're, we're continuing to be mining for feedback from our stakeholders around a, a variety of things. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, that, and that, I think that's where, you know, even for, you know, the admin team, as we sit down and do this, we have to understand that, you know, there are incremental steps. And, you know, how do we do this? And, you know, I mean, a lot of us would love to get there right now. But we understand it's you know five years, but that doesn't mean we're also going to sit back and just say, well, we got five years to do this. You know, we, we got time. No, th there are things that we have to put into motion now because five years will be here before we know it. Um, and we just want to make sure when we get to there that we you know, <coughs> the vision that we have, through our strategic plan, our portrait graduate, has been realized because of the steps we've taken. And so, but I, and I also said that goes back to the feedback. Strategic plans are meant to be malleable. I mean, you you adjust them on a yearly basis. So therefore. We may find that, you know, what we thought last year was important. Well, maybe next year there's a bit of a focus or a change, and so for we have to be able to pivot and adjust based upon feedback that we get from boards, from you know staff, students, you know, community, or all, all the above. So. Results. Yes. Great. Yep. Yeah, I know um, Middletown Springs did uh, <coughs> like a school climate survey, you know, pre-COVID, and I know that was like helpful for uh, the principal. Um, but uh, that's why I asked. Yep. Um, and then, and then the other question I had, just to make sure I heard you right, you know, going back to the, the dedicated career in, in, in college for tenth graders, you said that that was mandatory. Yeah, it's, it, all tenth graders will receive that course because we brought in driver's education last year, um, and that was something which we felt strongly about at Corey Valley was that all our students had access to 
driver's education during the course of the year, not during the summer where they you know had to adjust you know plans. And I, there are a lot of headaches with the summer pl you know programming, just vacations, and some students mm -hmm. missing out, and then it just was a nightmare. So we felt if we could get it, bring it into the you know school year, which we did. You know, <clears throat> I spent uh, you know semester at uh, at Proctor, then go uh, sorry, quarter Proctor quarter at uh, West Rutland, then I do believe two quarters at Pulteney High School, just because there are more students. But we also I think and Jen could talk a little bit more about this because she's on the schedule then. But there was a problem with I do believe is when some students were driving, like what do we do or you know there's time that needed to be filled. So you know, we said well you know, we really wanted to have this college and career course or a little bit more and, and that's you know what we we placed in there and now we're looking to kind of expand there adjust that Jen do you, is there anything we want to talk about a little bit about that uh, I mean the counselors got together and um, built this course about addressing just things as like an entryway and it's opposite of driver's ed it's um, like the guidance counselor in I building is doing it and she's bringing in a lot of speakers from out of um, different areas that kids are interested in so it's really developed by the kids that are in the classroom like what are your interests and how do we go from there they've built resumes they do um, they've gone over their PSAT results so it's really just like who's in your classroom what are they interested in how are we giving them like a taste of things that they could do in the career world or if they're prepared for college and just to tip I mean I, I would like to see and I know Jen's heard this before so I'd be a shock but I think this is a great first step, but I would like to see a five-year plan, really, where it begins in eighth grade, and then with each year, like what what does that look like for the students? So you know, uh, you know, so in, you know, when a student is a freshman, what should they be doing? What so what are we doing with them on college and career pathways? Sophomore year, and that's standard. And like I said, a lot of schools I've worked at, they have this, you know, this path in place. But really, is uh, you know, even just when we making the shift to have uh, foreign language as a, a graduation requirement. We found that there were some students who were scrambling at the last minute because they, they said, hey, I, I would like to apply to a college, but yet I need to have foreign language. And it was, it was just very difficult. So we, you know, just a simple little shift there. But that's part of that planning process is having some of our students start to think about, you know, graduation. Because they like said in high school, it does move pretty quickly, you know, for our students. And I say that because not necessarily graduation, really when you get to that, like I said, the sophomore year, the second half of the sophomore year, you have to start thinking about where you're going to be at. You know, you think about, you know, particularly if you're going to college, there's start to look at, you know, uh, you know SAT, ACT, start, you know, the, you know, the entrance, there's a lot of stuff because that junior year is just jam filled with things. And so if we can have a five-year plan, you know, a program in place where incrementally we can work through the students because we, we also can't rely upon the, the, the parents to do this as well. I think we have to assist our parents in this because for some of our parents, they're just not aware of like, oh, I, I should be doing this. I didn't know, no one told me to do this. Mm -hmm. Some are a little more proactive, but that, I think that's where you have this program. Um, and I think I said this is a great first step. And I think it's something I said the Corey Valley admins, you know, Jen, Jay and Joe, spent a lot of time discussing with this, but just it's, you know, how, how do we build that out? So like, um, for instance, so some kids might not be, uh, going the, the the traditional secondary school route, but they might they might want to um, go into a, an apprenticeship program. Uh, for instance, like uh, <clears throat> in New York State at Boses in Lake Lake George, uh, not Lake George, but uh, Queensbury, um, they have a machinist pro program. So these kids are going through a series of steps in order to become a journeyman's machinist, or uh, plumbing or or this and and these kids still need <coughs> to know what, how to navigate <clears throat> um, be beginning from here to get to their end goal so so do you invite um, for instance like GE apprenticeship program the lead there yes yeah that sort of thing right. uh, maybe a line like I have a we have a lineman that I know and the lineman instructor <coughs> teaches uh, teaches kids uh, right out of high school how to be uh, a, a lineman or a person I guess would be a better word nowadays um, you know so so these kids need to understand their goals and I think having having an understanding of their pathway will help them stay on task and and achieve better results 
And I think Eric will in line with that as well as, as admin and, and staff. We have to understand those pathways too. I know that mm -hmm. you know Jen was part of. We looked at the five traditional pathways students take and go from a, a like a high level, like a you know like a, a West Point or you know Service <coughs> Academy or uh, you know, like I said you know through career paths, whatever it might be. But we want to make sure that our students understand <coughs> the path. So if it is our goal to go this path or to this path, that here's what they, they take. But we also have to make sure that we provide the programming, the resources, the courses that. You know, we'll put them on that path as well. That's you know, that somehow they're sitting there and say, well, I really wanted to do this, but our schools didn't offer this, so I guess I have to do this. That that's the last thing we ever want to hear from our students right. is they backed into a path because we just didn't provide them. And but that's those are conversations we're going to have to have as 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 an SU and as districts is really just looking at you know, you know how do we pool resources and how do we you know what does that look like within our our uh, concentrates because individually. It's just very difficult to do, so we really have to look at more of a collective approach uh, to this. So. You mentioned that um, <clears throat> we have this in 10th grade, but you're looking at maybe an alternative age group. <clears throat> age group two, are you thinking like eighth grade maybe? Well, I so think, I, I think what I was, I think what I, right, what I said earlier, but I think that, that's part of that five-year plan. Well, I think the 10th grade and all the things <clears throat> that Jen listed there were appropriate for that 10th grade experience. But what would that look like for, you know, I, I always look at, you know, back to eighth grade because uh, that's really when you have start having conversations. And I know I have an eighth grade at home and, oh, what are you thinking? We, you know, you're annoying, Dad. Stop. Let me know. Jesus. <laughs> yeah. You know, but you know, start picking their brain a little bit. Just, and, you know, and even if we take a trip or a drive, like, we'll, we'll you know, what, what do you like to do? But just, you know, just understanding and just start to just open some things out. Like, well, yeah, you can do this or you can do that. And have just those conversations, but not everyone ha has those conversations. And so therefore we have to really look at is, in our schools, how can we begin opening, you know, because I, for a lot of our students, it, it, it's, it's a very small bubble. And, and I, I said, I, you know, in, in every place I worked when I was out in the suburbs, it was a very small bubble. And I, mean, you know, <clears throat> I, you know, I worked right across the street from Manhattan, or across the river from Manhattan, and how many of our students had never been to Manhattan? I mean, they just yeah. you know had the you know three three block radius, but so all students operate within a bubble. But it really is just helping them understand there are a lot of opportunities out there, whether it be local, regional, but just understanding really what your passions are. But also from a from our standpoint, also is you know as we identify these passions, okay, well then we're all starting to see a gap in programming and curriculum and, and you know course offering. So. The, the doc the uh, the doctor that's at Pulteney High School that is yes. is our nurse he's he like took Cora under his wing and provided <laughs> provided these sort of things uh, like uh, for instance when she was 16 she her summer uh, was was uh, going to Rutland Regional Medical Center and going through an LNA course that that would have that would have never happened without without his guidance. Jen? Well, I just wanted to add that um, a lot of what we're doing also is partnering with at <coughs> Proctor and I know Westerland did this, is going down to like the younger levels and talking about like dreaming about careers and like just not limiting your options. So right now the sophomores are creating like dream boards about certain careers so that kids can just kind of see what's out there because a lot of they only see what's inside their household and or they are only talking about that. So like what we dream big and then let's try to put you on that path so that's happening um in january and it'll happen with our middle school too great good all right um we can pop back up <clears throat> to old business linda wanted to look at board goals Do you, would it be easier to i'll just write them down next time so it goes in a packet and people can see them and then we could talk about it if it's too late to do that. I mean, sure. I mean, just so we have an idea what it is we're looking at to do. I think it was in the August or July. I can't yeah. remember. I'll just yeah. write them down and send them. Sure. Okay. Yeah. The nose bill. Do you want that to be just a recurring item on the agenda? Just our board goals. Just to always be on our old business. Yeah, or, that'd be nice. Or is it as like a quarterly thing? I just want to. Be, uh, I, I can just let Christine know, and then that way. Yeah. Uh, but well, if we do it in January, we could do it okay. quarterly. I think that's that's probably because we've done a lot already. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. And then <clears throat> the other question was executive committee. 
So meeting minutes are, are posted on the website. Um, the last meeting we discussed um, the facility reports. Um, the essence of executive committee meetings is for Chris to kind of use us as a filter and decide whether something's coming to this board or local boards and also so that um, let's say it's going to a local board that we're all doing it together so like we're not doing it in February and Eric's doing it in August or something so there's a level of continuity and then um, <clears throat> the other thing we talked about was the fast bridge presentation and we all had some ideas about uh, when they come back um, we thought that the data could be presented a little because we all see data differently um, Rutland Town has one school but we're looking at five principles providing so we kind of talked about how to nuance that so that was the essence of the meeting but meeting minutes there is a link on um, under GRC issue for executive committee meeting Thank minutes you. Thank you. All right. Um, <clears throat> policies. First or second read policies. B4, non discrimination. C1, board meetings, agenda preparation and distribution. D2, professional development. F12, weapons and firearms. A motion would be in order to approve the second reads. Motion. motion by Mike. Any discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Uh, we have two first read policies. Uh, is the pre-kindergarten admission a different policy then that you were they worked on that then? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, F3 GRC issue driver's education for resident students in tuition school districts and F8 pre-kindergarten admission. A motion would be in order to move these as second reads. So moved. Motion by Linda. Any discussion? I'll just I'll just add maybe some context to the driver's education policy. So, you know, currently we have like three driver's education policies, and so the idea was why not just make one GRCSU policy? So. Okay. All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Um, <clears throat> we still have no public with us. The next meeting date will be January 2nd, so make sure you take your aspirin before you come. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we do have a need for executive session <clears throat> for the evaluation of the superintendent. I make the motion to go to executive session for the session. Motion by Mike to enter executive session. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. All right, so we'll take a little recess and um, I don't know, let's say 8.15 and does Colin have a link? Colin, I'll send you a link right now.